In previous videos, we've looked at uh, getting Scatter, the program Scatter, onto your computer, uh, subtracting and reducing data that you collected using the inline HPLC on a SAX beam line, um, and also uh, averaging and subtracting data that you've collected using, uh, like for example, a liquid handling robot, so static data. Uh, we've looked at those things. Um, today, I want to look at the, the sort of primary data quality metrics that you're going to look at. This is the sort of thing that you would do at the beamline or at the lab home source um, while you're collecting the data just to, to um, make some kind of a, a decision about whether the data is any good or not. So, um, so in here you'll see I've done a, a dilution series. I've got um, bovine serum albumin at 5 mg per mil, 2.5 mg per mil, 1.25 mg per mil, 0.6 and 0.3. So I'm just going to drag those into this channel in the Scatter Files tab. Okay, so here I go. So there they are. Um, now uh, I'll ignore this view for the time being and I'll go straight to the Analysis tab. This is the tab where you're going to be doing most of your uh, reduction. Um, and so here, here are your images. Now uh, you'll see the list of files and the, these are checked and then down the side you'll see that there are various kind of thumbnail plots. If I click on one of these um, you'll see that it, it comes up in the thumbnail plots. Okay. Um, so the first thing that I would be doing here is the Guinea analysis. Um, so to do that, you click on this G button. Um, so we'll start at the five mg per mil. I'll click on G, um, and we bring up this plot. Now this is uh, at the top here. This is just your raw data. Uh, we've changed the units for the plot. Um, instead of plotting. Uh, the Q, which is the sort of scattering vector, uh, which is normally in inverse angstroms um, versus the intensity. We've now plotted Q squared versus the log of the intensity. Um, and there's an approximation um, in which a globular particle, monodispersed particle, will show a straight line uh, relationship in the low Q regime here. Um, you can see the red is our straight line and then this kind of greenish color uh, the data comes down. It looks like a reasonable approximation to the straight line down here and then it sort of deviates from the straight line. Down here your residuals, this is just the difference between the that straight line and the points. Um, you can see in the residuals the same kind of uh, trend. Okay. Um, now, down here, Q times RG limits, that is, we calculate from the gradient of this line what the radius of gyration would be, and then you say that the, the Q max here, um, the, the sort of last point in your guinea fit, times the radius of gyration must be less than 1.3. And so the, the scatter uh, guinea fitting tool has automatically included data in this plot out to Q times RG of 1.3 or, or just below. Okay. Now, what the, the guinea approximation says is that a globular monodispersed particle should scatter in a straight line uh, using this plot out to 1.3. But as your particle deviates from the ideal, the relationship may break down earlier. So your guinea fit should never go above 1.3, but at times you won't even make it out to 1.3. And you can see here that we don't make it out to 1.3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the maximum Q here until I feel as though we're getting a straight line. Um, and I would I would go to about there. So you can see now the residuals are roughly random around the line. There's a bit of structure in this, um, uh, probably coming from the beamline setup, um, and so it's not quite perfect. But you can see uh, that we've now got a roughly straight line fit. Okay, and what that's done is up here you can see there is now a radius of gyration. 
and an I0 calculated for the 5 mg per mil BSA sample. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to continue to do this for all of them. Um, okay, so you know, roughly that. Now here, uh, as we go to lower concentration, um, the the signal is dropping all the time. Okay, we've got a nice or nice-ish straight line fit here. You can see we're beginning to deviate a little bit at low Q. You can see that particularly in these residuals. Um, often uh, around the beam stop, you get um, a little bit of background scatter or a little bit of some sort of artifact. You've maybe included a little bit of the beam stop shadow in the beam or something like that. Now, a high concentration this effect may be so small that you just don't see it, but as you drop down in concentration, it begins to come in. So it's okay to clip away a little bit of your data at low Q until you're you know, happy that you've got something real. Um, uh, aggregation in the sample would also show up at low Q, but in that case, you would tend to see, um, you know, you've got a, a sort of straight line fit for your guinea, and then it really slopes off at some point, it's not valid just to cut that out. So if you're cutting away, you know, 30, 40, 50 points down here, um, you probably have to go back and have a look at your data quality. But, you know, clipping away a few points at low Q is, is fine. Um, okay. Um, and then just here, the last one. Um, you'll see we're actually starting to look like a straight line fit here. Um, it's possible that that sort of deviation, uh, the data is noisy to the point that we, we don't really see that. Okay, Now, um, with this 0.3 mg per mil sample, um, it's just so noisy that I'm not even going to do anything with that. Um, so let's just ignore that for now. Um, okay, so what we're looking for now is... Uh, if you have concentration-dependent multimerization in your sample or you know, some sort of concentration-dependent effect, you're going to see uh, that the radius of, of gyration varies as a function of concentration. And you can see here that it really doesn't. You know, 47.7, 48, you know, these are all more or less the same within the error of the experiment. The other thing is uh, you should see the I0 vary linearly with the concentration. So if you half the concentration, you half the I0. Um, and that, you know, just looking by I, you know, that's roughly it. You know, 4.5 is roughly half of, of 9, um, 17, 18, roughly twice 9. Um, and then, you know, when we're going up. So, you know, roughly linear. You could actually take these out into an Excel sheet and plot them and just see, you know, fit a straight line to your I0, uh, plot your, your radius of duration as a function of concentration and just have a look for these sorts of relationships. Um, but that's a good thing to do. Um, and obviously we've also derived RG and I0, which are our sort of primary parameters. Okay, so, so that's the first thing to do. Um, then down here, we're basically going to start at the top here. We're going to work down here along the bottom and back up the other side as a sort of a primary way of looking at the data. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to select one uh, image. Okay, so um, the the this is just a plot of the data. Um, you can see it looks fine there. Um, you know, interestingly, if we uh, select all of them. Again, just for a second, um, I'll, do, I'll put this one in as well. Um, uh, again, with a concentration series, you should see that they are roughly parallel. Um, you want to see a, a sort of a parallel relationship. If you see a deviation from that, it's a good indication that you've got some kind of concentration effect. You'll see that the point three data is just nothing down here. Um, it should have been sitting around here. It's possible that there was some kind of buffer subtraction issue with the point three data, so that's why I'm ignoring it. Um, okay, so that's that's just a sort of a visual inspection of the data. Um, then we do the normalized cracky plot. Um, Okay, so what's happened here is there's obviously a point at high Q um, that is skewing the scaling here. So, so what I'm going to do here is I'll just get rid of that point. Um, this isn't very convenient. There we are. Okay, 
So I, I just got rid of a few points. Okay. Um, sorry about all this clicking, clickety clicking. Okay, so here we are. Now, um, the dimensionless crack key plot is, is a crack key plot, uh, and it's scaled using the radius of gyration. So if you try and do your normalized crack key plot before you've done your Guinea analysis and got a reasonably accurate estimate of RG, this is going to not be accurate. So just make sure that you do that first, okay? Um, but the idea here is that for a globular monodispersed sample, the top of this peak here will set bang on that crosshair like this okay and come back down again um, uh, globular samples you'll get a peak and then it will essentially close uh, at high Q so it'll come all the way back down to the baseline um, and then for an unfolded sample this will come up and then it'll it'll just continue to rise with time so uh, the cracky plots are giving you a sense of whether it's flexible you know unfolded or whether it's globular um, and then this thing here is really telling you about how how globular it is and how monodispersed it is uh, this is bsa collected on the robot um, and bsa exists as a monomer dimer tetramer uh, equilibrium and solution um, and so this is not a monodispersed sample and this is really the first indication that we've had that, that this isn't a great sample um, notice that that uh, polydispersity isn't really reflected across the concentration series as well. So you know, so this is a good thing to do. Okay, so this is an indication that we're not dealing with a perfect system um, here. Okay, um, the Guinea peak analysis um, is just you know obviously we've we've done our Guinea fitting here. Um, you know we uh, truncated this data back to about there to get a straight line fit. This is just another look at it and uh, the, the red model is showing the trajectory of where the data should be when it uh, agrees with the Guinea and you can see it sort of deviating here. So we've truncated it back to where it fits with this uh, curve. You know the residuals are more or less right, there's a bit of a bend in the residuals there but you know it's not too bad. Okay, so it's just another way of looking at the Guinea and when you're doing your Guinea analysis it might be worth pulling up this Guinea peak analysis just for another look at it. Um, for sense, you know, you take any help you can get. Okay, and then um, uh, the flexibility. Okay, now uh, in SACS data we have at low Q the, uh, the Guinea regime that's looking at the sort of overall size and shape of the particle and that's obviously where we do our Guinea fitting. Um, and then we have a sort of an inflection point where the, the data rolls over and then we have a power law slope where the data drops off to some power. Okay, um, For proteins, the, that slope will trend as somewhere between Q to the minus 4 uh, and that would be a folded uh, globular particle, we would have a, a parod slope of q to the minus 4 and then as we become more diffuse uh, heading towards completely unfolded flexible peptide in solution we tend towards q to the minus 2 so in this plot here we've got q to the 4, q to the 3 and q to the 2 um, and depending on the nature of our particle we should see a plateau on one of these plots so if I grab this slider here and drag it back what I'm looking for here is the first sort of plateau region. So you'll see here, um, this has come up and it's plateaued. Um, my Q to the three is dropping and my Q to the two is dropping even more quickly. So what that's telling us is that um, it's probably a, a globular particle. Uh, it's not diffuse and flexible, it, it's globular because we've got this. And it tells us that uh, we would be expecting a parod slope of roughly Q to the 4. Um, uh, and, and this is from this estimate. Okay. Now, using the slider, we've set our maximum value for this plateau region using this plot. So I'm going to close this now. And the next thing I'm going to do is look at this uh, volume. We're doing these out of order now, you'll notice. Um, I'm going to do this volume thing here. Okay, so the parod to buy, this is our Q to the 4, and you'll see that that Q max that we chose using the slider has been automatically set here, and it's point number 428. This blue line here 
is going to be the straight line fit to this slope, okay? Um, and you'll see it, you know, it's, it's not a straight line fit at the moment. Now, I could use this arrow here to gradually work my way up to a point where I'm going to be uh, fitting this. That takes ages. So I normally just put in a number here that's maybe, you know, sort of 40 or 50 points shy of this. So I'll do like sort of 380. Um, and that'll just bring me into the ballpark. Um, and then I'm basically using these to fit this kind of straight line part here. Again, here's my residuals. You want them randomly distributed around this line, okay? Um, and that gives us a parod slope of four, uh, which is what we expected from that flexibility plot. Now, another nice feature of this is it gives you then a volume for your particle. Um, so 206, 224 cubic angstroms. Uh, you can divide that through by the the density of protein. Um, when I'm doing this, I use an approximation of 1.7. So 206224 divided by 1.7 should give you the molecular weight of your particle. Now, you need to take this with a pinch of salt. Um, it's an approximation. Uh, in this case, we've obviously got a polydispersed sample, so we're, it's going to be an average of everything. Um, and also, as your Perod slope deviates from 4, heading towards flexibility. You can imagine your flexible particle, uh, you know, when you average all of your flexible particles in solution together, you get a kind of a fuzzy cloud, which has a much larger volume than you'd expect. Um, and so this will be much bigger and it'll give you, you know, very large molecular weight. So um, this will work pretty well for a nice globular monodispersed sample perod slope for um, you've got no uh, multimerization issues or anything that should work reasonably well um, but you know in this case and and in a lot of cases it actually gives you a fairly inaccurate estimate but you know it's something that's kind of worth uh, keeping in mind okay so it's telling us we we don't have a flexible particle it's it's nice and globular um, but we know from the normalized Kretke plot that it is somewhat um, uh, sort of poorly monodispersed. Okay, so the last thing I want to look at here is the the VC plot. Um, you know, here's my dodgy point at the end uh, that I had to get rid of before. Um, I might just get rid of those again so that we can see that a bit better. Um, it's not going to like me. Okay, don't worry about that. Um, essentially, the VC plot, uh, this plot here, if you've got a good buffer subtraction, you'll see this curve coming up and plateauing. Um, where you see it coming up and continuing to rise, it's often uh, an indication that your buffer subtraction is quite poor. Um, and it needs to be looked at. Um, so, you know, mine rises a little bit, but that's not too bad. This looks all right. Um, uh, you know, if, it, if, it's, if it's rising much more steeply than this, you have to go back and have a look at your, your buffer subtraction. Okay, so, so those are the steps that I would be going through at the beam line. Um, just having a quick look at my data as it comes off, making sure that it's of high quality, asking myself the question, do I need to go back and measure something different with the sample? You know, do I need to re-measure the buffer, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, I would usually have an Excel spreadsheet open and I'll be writing some of these numbers down, um, you know, making some plots, thinking as well about what I might want to include in a paper um, as kind of evidence that the, the data is of high quality. Um, so I hope that was helpful and uh, thank you for listening.